he he is a founder of uh, Rainwater Park, one of the earliest uh, to pi to pioneer to evangelize rainwater harvesting and sustainable water management. You would have been you would have read his articles in Hindu. So he's been at it for many many years and has accumulated you know, some wisdom to share with us today. Thank you for coming. Right. So we were talking a lot from the morning, very really solid interesting work and that's the very nice thing about Bangalore that uh, from uh, looking at STPs and uh, Dr. Anand's uh, report also suggests perhaps uh, the city with the single largest number of STPs, functional or dysfunctional. Uh, seriously, but uh, in, in India, it's something. And the city, the first city to be uh, drinking uh, wastewater, blending it, and then passing it through a narrow, the first city in India to be doing that, matching up with Singapore standards and all that. So it's really nice to see um, so many things happening. And what is the reason, perhaps, why these things are happening? Is something that I would like to briefly touch upon because it gives a slightly broader platform to what uh, initiatives you all are taking. So my talk is uh, uh, not so much as within the fence because you're all worried about your compound wall, rightly so, the apartment wall or the layout wall and what's happening inside and how do you get more efficient, how do you recycle more and how do you do rainwater harvesting better. I'll also talk a bit of beyond the fence and why you should also engage beyond the fence. And just a little bit more on all those other uh, issues there. And so uh, one of the key things that you are doing at your uh, suboptimal level is what is called integrated urban water management. And that integrated urban water management, as I'll come to describe, uh, is what you're all practicing or are on the way to practice. Uh, within the fence, this is all, this is what I heard. Not, uh, this, PP, this PPT will be up on SlideShare, you guys will get it. Uh, SlideShare.net, Zen Rainman, the PPT is already there, so you can at any point of time download it. SlideShare.net slash Zen Rainman. Many of these stuff is on YouTube also. So dual plumbing, you heard a lot, we see that that's happening. Water efficient fixtures, rainwater harvesting, wastewater reuse, metering, which will be discussed, pricing, Pricing is something crucial, which I didn't hear too much of, uh, of a discussion on. But we have Rainbow Drive here presented, which has vast experience on pricing. And uh, how key that is, I'll just have two slides to share with that. Very silent uh, observer uh, for something which has uh, happened very nicely. And something about water literacy also, which is a crucial thing. I think communication, convincing the uh, AGM, the the committee and getting things ac across and appropriate landscape is what we heard within the fence all these are happening within the fence but what could happen beyond the fence is what is happening globally so what we need to do is to look at integrating all these water that is pipe water pipe water will continue to be a reality a lot of apartments will still continue to depend on bwssb some may not get it but then uh, should we uh, not ask for it or demand it as uh, citizens of this fair city is something that we should not give up because simply because the BWSB is not giving us water doesn't mean we, have, we say we don't want it. Should we or should we not uh, exert some right on it? Strong water, integrated sewage and groundwater, but then manage it holistically. And what one will see right from the morning also is that the institutions in Bangalore are not geared to do this. The BWSSB is responsible for the pipe water and the water going in the sewage lines. If the same sewage goes in the stormwater drains. It is the jawadari of the BBMP or the BDA. If that sewage enters the lakes, then it goes to the LDA or whoever is in charge of it. But if the sewage goes into the groundwater, then it's the mines and geology which is monitoring it, not responsible for it. And rainwater is everybody's property, as we see. Groundwater is also everybody's property. It's a common property. It's a private individual resource. Those should be treated as a CPR. So if we don't have the right institutions to manage water, we will be suboptimizing and ourselves trying to become self-sufficient. So that's one uh, thing that we have to note. And so we have to push our city itself to be a water sensitive city. And what does that mean? Typically how systems go, cities go is first it becomes a water supply city, you get water in. Then a sewer city, sewer lines start getting rain. Drain city, stormwater drains put in place. Waterway cities, if you have canals uh, in your cities. Water cycle city, which is to complete the hydrological cycle at the city scale. And finally a water sensitive city, which is not only 
drinking water, consuming water for our cells, but ensuring that there are water bodies and streams and lakes and rivers which are flowing clean and which have to be enjoyed for social, cultural and ecological reasons, not purely functional reasons. The large fountains of the city, for, so to say, not the small fountains in, inside the planet. And so that's why uh, it becomes important as to why these things are manifesting themselves in Bangalore. And one of the reasons is this, that we are sitting on a ridge line up there and we depend on the rains in Palakkad for our water. So it's the rain in Kerala actually which flows into Kabini, comes to the Kabini Reservoir, joins the Kaveri, comes to Tarikad Nalli, is pumped up there to our city. And the cost of water, the true cost of water for Bangalore, if you calculate the capital cost, the older cost, and the sinking fund to replace the infrastructure is 80 rupees a kiloliter. Dr. Anand, that 80 rupees, if it is charged correctly, that is only fresh water. I'm not talking about the wastewater being collected, conveyed, treated, and then discharged as per standards, which would add another 25 to 30 rupees a kiloliter, at least. So totally net-net, it should be 110 rupees a kiloliter. That's the true cost of water, the true ecological cost of water. The moment the city charges that, all our systems become payback periods drop for two months, three months, and six months, and everything becomes viable, and everything becomes efficient. But unless the system sends that signal as to what the true cost of water is, we are only going to stumble along suboptimally. And we're not going to reach where uh, TZ has reached because the pricing is all faulty. Luckily or unluckily for us, the private water tankers are doing what the government should have been doing. They're charging 100 rupees, 150 rupees a kiloliter, which is the true cost of water, which is actually the true cost of water, the true realistic cost of water. And therefore, systems are kicking into place. You're looking at your rainwater harvesting, you're looking at wastewater, you're looking at uh, recycling and reuse. So that's the background for where it's coming. And the big ticket solutions will also come to the city because all this talk about getting water from Lingam, Makki and all that stuff is going to take at least a decade, if not anything else. So in the meantime, what do we do? That would be the question. And so the questions that we have to ask also is what are we doing about the catchment of the basin? What are we doing to preserve the forests in Kodagu and in Wainad <coughs> so that the water comes to the city? Zilch, nothing. We just believe that the water in the Kaveri will always flow, that there will be water in the Kabili and in the KRS, and that water will come to us in Bangalore, 1,350 MLD, or whatever is the number which the BWSSP gives. But isn't it at risk? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. The other question which becomes very interesting in Bangalore is this watershed map. Each one of those polygons that you see there represents a water body. That's the catchment or watershed from which it would have gone to a lake. Many of them have disappeared. But we need planning tools and we need to locate ourselves, our apartments and our layouts within that urban watershed and start engaging beyond the fence to see what's happening there. Because that more or less, it, this, uh, these are the numbers which uh, keep fluctuating that there are about 183 lakes in the BBMP jurisdiction, the BBMP tells us. And some of them is with them and some of them are with others. These two numbers, along with Along with this, the hydrogeological map will determine whether the water is there in your bore wells or not. It is not a question of sinking deep bore wells. You can sink anywhere after you hit 600 feet and get beyond, your chance of striking water diminishes. And beyond 600 feet, if you get to 800, 900, 1000 feet, the life of the bore well is dramatically reduced. It's not going to last more than four years. At most, one year, two years is the norm, 1,000 feet, 1,100 feet. It's completely unsustainable. And the most important thing is, at this depth, you do not know where the water is recharging to emerge here. You do not know the recharge zone at all. So you cannot do plenty, you can do plenty little for it. The shallower the bore well, the more easily and more amenable it is to rainwater harvesting and recharge. The deeper the bore well, the more difficult it is. So that we have to figure out and we have to see how these two, three are layered. And there's the 10% rule in the rural context and it should be applied in the urban context. And what is that 10% rule? That for every land use, you have to devote 10% for water. If you don't do that, then you do not have sustainability. It, to begin with, a 5% rule would be a damn good effort in itself, but 10% is the norm in semi-arid and arid India. And that's where you get these waters in these uh, reservoirs and lakes, which then emerges in our aquifer. And that's important to understand. If we manage the lake at the regional context, at the watershed level, our groundwaters will always be full if we draw a water balance there. If we don't, then we'll have problems with groundwater. And that's, that's the well. Uh, uh, the well also represents something else very interesting, and this is what's coming uh, across here. For getting one kiloliter of water to the city, Bangalore, it takes 1.88 units of energy. 
to pump the water to the city, 1.88. If there is water in your open well, it will take you about 0.2 units of energy. There are fact 0.1 to 0.2 units to get that same one kiloliter because it's just a question of height and distance, right? So that's the way it is. So wells and shallow aquifers and lower the groundwater table, lower your boreholes, 100 feet or 150 feet or 200 feet, savings in energy, savings in carbon emission makes ecological sense also. This is the reason why we need to start to figure it out. So therefore, when we look at treated wastewater coming back into the system, if the embodied energy in the treated wastewater is less than 1.88 units per kilometer, we are already doing an energy saving to the city, and usually it is. So then what I have is think the law which came in, and these are the figures which are very interesting for us, comes from this, that if you leave a natural piece of land, the surface runoff from that land, unbuilt, is 15 liters of every 100 liters that's what. Recharge is 10 liters maximum. Maximum of 10 liter only goes beyond one meter. And evapotranspiration is 75 liters. That is to say 75 liters out of 100 liters would go into just that one meter depth of soil, be taken up by grass, plants, trees, and just by capillary action and evaporated. So only 10 liters is actually recharging naturally. Once it is built upon, the figures are there, 95, 5. And that 5 and 5 are also exaggerated. It actually is 0. It's 100, 0, 0 if you build up. So the strong water drain now has to deal with what was 15 is now 90, six times the number. So therefore, strong water drains fail. The whole basis of rainwater harvesting then becomes biomimicry. Can we get back recharge and storage so that 90 becomes 15? That's the thinking. It is not the supplemental water that we require. That happens incidentally. It's can we mimic the natural hydrological cycle of the plot of land or of the city? How do we do it? And so therefore, those big ticket numbers are there. Rooftop rainwater, highest quality. You uh, filter it and store it usually and recharge the rest of it. And landscape area, major storm water drains should be linked to lakes. That's the uh, basic plethora. So that's why the bylaw has been created, which says that for every square meter of roof area, you should do 20 liters storage or recharge. And for every square meter of paved area, 10 liters of storage or recharge. This is the simplest bylaw in the whole world. <laughs> There's no other thing. And yet it is violated, you all know. So if we as a democratic society are not capable of implementing even the basic, basic simple one, what do we do? The minimum depth of the recharge well is 3 meters and that's been put in to cut through the clay layer if there is any and to get below the root zone of trees so that the water that we put in into the ground actually goes to the aquifer. That's the idea with the bylaw, with the rainwater harvesting bylaw, as, as simple as that. And so then, therefore, you have to understand the pattern as was explained in the previous uh, case study. You have to understand the rainfall pattern, distribution, intensity, and then design systems. But then, the city can aim that every roof be a catchment. And that every roof a catchment and a clean roof actually means that your leaves and silt and dust, etc., will not come into the water at all. And this is the one city which has a theme park. I don't know how many of you have visited this theme park. Please go January 5th block. With great difficulty, with the help of the people from TZ also, this theme park has been created. No other city has such a theme park. Where every one of these ideas and issues are explained meticulously, and you can learn about including wastewater reuse and recycling. And with Dr. Amin's help, we should try to improve the capacity there so that people are better informed as to the choices that they make. The report of the PCB should be up there with exact shown as to how these systems look, what do they cost and what gets to be there because this becomes then a water literacy center. This is currently being run by the Bay of Places. But the pathetic thing is that there are no footfalls. There's nobody going here in the city of power. So we've got to learn uh, to engage with citizens in a more institutional communication framework. For example, green storm water drains and so on, which are displayed there. Why should we not lo look at it? Uh, one final thing, rainwater harvesting also kicked in such a lot of economic development into the city that it, provide, it created an investment of 750 crores over a time frame of one year. And all the money went towards creating livelihoods to plumbers and well diggers and so on, so far. And 40 rainwater harvesting filters were developed. So innovation has also been kicked in. So these are the side effects of working on water and water literacy. We need to invest a lot more. One of the things that was being discussed was recharge wells. Do they make sense or not? Or should we make deep borers? What one finds is you make one recharge well. Typical three feet diameter, 20 feet deep. Test it. Put water into it. Get a tanker, fill it up. Measure what is the rate of infiltration. You have a number to assess how many more recharge wells you know. Average recharge rates, 6,000 liters to 10,000 liters an hour in lateritic soil, most of Bangalore. 6,000 liters to 10,000 liters an hour for a recharge well. For a low, 
for every square meter of lead, the rate of recharge per day is 5 liters to 20 liters per day for every square meter. With a recharge well, it's 6,000 liters to 10,000 liters. So the numbers vary dramatically and direct recharge makes a lot more sense than storing it in the lake. Lakes are needed, that recharge is needed, but these are the kind of differences that you have. And like I say, you monitor the rate of recharge, figure out how it is, and then you can start to work on it. And there have been stories after stories here where open ones have been revived with the recharge, open wells. And bore well depths have become shallower, and water is available at shallower bore wells. Don't forget the maintenance. Maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. There's no word in the Indian language for maintenance. Kannada, Tamil, Marathi. No, there's no word at all. It doesn't exist. There's no word for maintenance. So if it doesn't exist in our mind and in our culture, Maintenance is an English word. Equivalent word in any one of the Indian languages, including Hindi, Marathi, not there. Maram Matta, that you do, that's Jivar. It doesn't mean maintenance. No? It means it when it's broke, let's fix it. It doesn't say take care of it so that it doesn't break. And then other stuff is needed in terms of design of stormwater drain itself to become infiltration uh, basins that has gone on, or basins in the larger layouts. One can start to look at it to get the water down. And that's why it's very important because we have been, uh, we have something like four lakh borewells in Bangalore, the single largest density for any city in India. No other city has this. The kind of investments that have gone in, but individuals like us, net present value is 8,000 crores, more than the cavalry first, second, third, fourth, fourth stage, phase two. People have invested more in water extraction than the BWSSB with World Bank JICA assistance in getting water from the Kaveri. That's the truth. So it is in our interest and the city's interest that that doesn't become dead capital. A groundwater table calls 8,000 crores of dead capital will lie us 4.5 inch or 6 inch holes in the ground. Yeah, so that's why we need to rejuvenate it because this is a culture go going back to the Indus Valley days. That's local. That's, and this is Sarnath, what the Buddha gave his first sermon. Remember, we are not only connected to the Buddha by his sayings and his spirituality and his wisdom, but perhaps through the well from which the Buddha drank. Because this well still has water and the water is sweet. And this well is 2300 BC. So when we talk sustainable technologies, can you think of a technology which lasts 5000 years and yet continues to serve? So that is the connection we have to establish. This is what we have to think about. Right? And because this this is not only about technology, I don't know how many of you have seen this this kind of uh, this this uh, device. The whole development of technology, of technology as we call it, is hydro driven, is driven from the well. First, the essential characteristic of human beings, laziness. So you make it easy to draw water from the well. What did you do? You put a stick to the rope and you start to solve it. Then the rope became a pulley. The pulley then became the person wheel. So technology gets itself going from groundwater. And let's also imagine that groundwater is that hole in the ground which gives water liberates you from the tyranny of rivers and lakes. And that's how it goes. And this is what they call the Persian meal, but is what is actually the Indian meal because this was developed somewhere around Rajasthan, Sindh area. And this is what it, it all is. This is our heritage. The last one in Karnataka disappeared last year. The last one in Karnataka. We don't have any, any more left. Only some remain in Udaipur in Rajasthan. But we need to sort of think about it. Because the other thing about the uh, open wells is that it makes groundwater visible. Otherwise, groundwater is called an invisible resource. But with an open well, it's talking to you, it's communicating to you, it's telling you summer is coming or a drought is coming. Yeah? And you have to lessen your water consumption. It cannot be 135 NPCD, 365 days a year, 366 a leap year. That standardization in Jaisalmer also or in Bangalore or in Cherapunji is, is pretty much a cause of concern. Now we come to the era of the borehole. Whereas what was a visible resource, groundwater, now here's groundwater at 450 feet depth. There is no river or stream there. There is no large reservoir. It's cracks and fissures in the ground which is bringing water in into the hole and from which we are extracting using 30 HP, 40 HP. Now if we say reach up, also imagine that the water has to go back the same crack or fissure resisting the water flow. So when we Think about where we are in fact, let's remember what this is all about. Now how do you communicate this to 30 million extractors of water from borewells in India? 30 million borewells in India, world's largest number. And nobody has a clue. How is a borewell plant identified in your apartment or layout or, or site? A dude comes with a coconut <laughs> or a rifle 
Seriously, this is happening since 5,000 years. We'll get a journal of this, but we'll get it verified by this fellow with a fork or a pendulum or a coconut, right? That's the technology that's removed with geology for us, hydrogeology. 250 cubic kilometers of water is being drawn from the ground, 30 million more wells, and the coconut determines the fate of where that more has to be drilled. We have no clue of that. And this is therefore water literacy which we have to start to learn and figure out and to deal with and understand that it's it's a damn scarce resource and then we do it. So have cities and towns done something about it? Belgram is a classic example. They ran into a drought. But they remember that Sarah Mishishwaraya had given a report saying that the openers of Belgram could feed the town itself. They went back, they cleaned up. So now the number is about 82 open wells, which is supplying water to about three and a half lakh people in Belgram. That, at that point of time, it was about 2 lakh uh, people that was being done, but every year they pick it up and with community effort, they decent the open well, not a money, uh, paisa is spent. The community is persuaded not to invest Ganeshas into it, and the open well through a rapid sound filter and an online coordinator is connected to the grid and what is supplied. The best part is it is supplied at 76 paisa per kiloliter. Once you get the price of water down, you can make it pro poor, give it to everybody free of cost also, 6,000 liters or 8,000 liters. But then that depends on how you manage the aquifer, the wastewater, the rainwater and the pipe water together to lower the price of water. Yeah? So it has a social benefit also. And Rainbow Drive, I come to Rainbow Drive because for me, this has been the first citizen and community driven effort uh, on Sarzapur Road, Bangkok is at Metro. I guess um, some of you would have seen this uh, place also. Otherwise, I invite you on behalf of uh, the Rainbow Drive Association. What would have happened? 360 plots, no BWSSB connection. There would have been 360 bore wells. Sure, 2 lakh rupees a bore well. 7 times 2 crore rupees on 360 straws into the same glass to extract water, competing against each other. You drink 400 feet, I drink 500, she drink 700. That's what would have happened. But what the association did wisely at that point of time was to put a ban on private borders. You know, private borders. There's no law, but it is a social construct of the bank it. And so they got about at that point of time three borders. Right, sir? And but they put in 360 recharge wells. 300, 360, the number varies. But everybody competed to put in recharge wells. And the, in, uh, the investment was given by individuals. Not by the association. The association leaned on the individuals, but the individuals made the investment. So then it doesn't become a big burden on the association, right? Now, they put in place a tariff system where if you consume more than 20,000 liter water, the 20,001 liter will cost you 150 rupees a kiloliter. 150 rupees a kiloliter, that's what the tariff is. So everybody dropped it down to 20,000. Why did they have to do it? And this is very important. It's a slightly complex uh, uh, it's there on the web, but what it means is, initially when they started, the average consumption was about 265 liters per capita per day. And at 265 liters per capita per day, with even the best rainwater harvesting, they would have been at a net deficit of 32 million liters per year. They would have been extracting 32 million liters per year more than what we were putting in into the ground. But if they dropped it to 150 LPCD, and if they did recharge, they would be at a net surplus of 2 million liters per year, putting 2 million liters more into the ground than what they were drawing, water positive. Not only that, they had 44 million liter treated wastewater available to them, which is not accounted for. So if they put that 44 million liter per year into the whole system, there would be net surplus of 46 million liter per year. Net surplus of 46 million liter per year. It's not only water positive, it's really contributing to the city and to the community. You can imagine that this treated wastewater could go to the nearest lake if the PCB allowed. And that it would invigorate the lake and it would be doing good for the whole community. So that's the kind of thing that uh, Bangalore does pretty well. Gets the community, gets the association and they kick in with an idea and they really wade in and do that. For example, this classic orchards behind uh, Minachi Temple. Look at the size of the open well. They took out 120 truckloads of silt from an open well. 120 truckloads of silt last year and they put it on the landscape because this is good manure, they didn't throw it out. Now, that's the water level there. They even put in <coughs> feet and numbers and all. In theory, this one open well could supply classic orchards water for six to eight months. One open well. So you're not only saving heritage, now you're looking at rainwater harvesting to recharge the whole layout so that the well will always be full of water. You're taking it up and then you're able to do it. So, and treated based water, Anand's, Dr. Anand's uh, SCP is running there. That also is being drawn in into the layout to, to water the landscape. But then it also did things like getting Muniapa, who's from the Bodhi community or the Namuapa, 
traditional community which did earn the open wells and tanks of this area, who are gone because well digging was gone as a profession. Now this dude has done more than 2,000 open wells. It's a Guinness Book of World Record. Nobody has done 2,000 open wells at all. They charge wells like that. So all these possibilities go. Finally, the last point that I want to quickly touch. This is the wastewater. Uh, Regulation uh, as uh, prescribed by the PCB for urban use, right, sir? Yeah, yeah. So it needs many imaginations. At the city level, the imagination right now is only for industrial use. Tertiary treated water supplied to BIA, ITC, BEL, and other companies for industrial use. But perhaps we could do it as an ecosystem service also, right? So this is Jakhpur as an example. UASB plus extended aeration, that's the valley there. And this is the lake, 53 hectares lake. That you see is a constructed wetland, and above that is the wastewater treatment plant, which is 10 ml. You see more of a detail of the 10 ml wastewater treatment plant, a constructed wetland, and then the lake itself. And there are open wells. There are more than 100 open wells of the size that I showed you all around. Now the design capacity is 10 ml. We'll pass through the numbers because they're not very uh, relevant. Uh, and the design parameters for flowing was there, for outflow it was designed, and this is the USB reactor with the extended aeration system there, now functioning at about 7 MLD, and the location becomes crucial. Where is this located vis-a-vis -vis the lake? It's upstream of the lake, upstream of the constructed wetland. The treated water enters into the wetland system of the lake, and nature is further treatment. The wetland and the lake itself becomes a further uh, improvement system. And stomach pain is prevented from getting in directly, so it's a cell trap, which then re reveals that the lake water quality is excellent and the lake is always full. Even now, the lake is full, brimming, full. And it has recharged the aquifer. The aquifer recharge is estimated as between 7 and 8 million liters per day. 7 to 8 MLD of recharge is happening, which is now. Not to, not to mention the 200 kgs of fish to add to the protein requirement of the city of Bangalore. It can go up to 500 kgs, sells at 120 rupees a kg, 24,000 rupees. In theory, the fish can pay for the running of the wastewater treatment plant. Unfortunately, the fish money goes to the fisheries department, the wastewater treatment plant money is run by the BWSB, and the BWSB sees that as an expenditure center or a cost center, the fisheries guys see it as a revenue center and they will very go on fishing. The key is how do you tie these two two people together. Take them for a drink. Uh, take them for a drink. <laughs> Sponsored by you, right. I'm also joined. But yeah, when the aquifer are full and the open well is full, the little girl can draw water. The sludge sells for eight thousand to nine thousand rupees a truckload. It's we are testing it now with the GKVK. Excellent tomato production, excellent plant production, good P and K values which are there. It goes for three hundred kilometers. It goes all the way to Chitrandiga, people pay for it, the BWSSB gets zero, zilch, nothing. The farmer, who, so there's a fellow who runs it, sells it in these trucks, one truck load a day. And the wells are full. The well will re re really need a rapid sand filter and an online chlorinator and is drinking water. Now, so look at the lakes around your layouts and apartments. See whether this kind of a system can start to make sense. Let's dialogue with the pollution control board to see that the surplus wastewater which comes from your STPs is used meaningfully with perhaps these lakes and tanks as recipients so that the entire aquifer is improved and therefore the whole thing benefits us in totality. And these pelicans who used to be migratory now are permanent settlers of Bangalore. They are getting their UID shortly because there's fish there. And they're staying there their terrain. And they're there now in the if you go there. They should have gone by March, but they're there. So, so you can create the whole ecosystem thing plus get the functionality. You get your water, you get your sludge, you get your birds. And this is another one, Yalmalapa Chetty, which goes to Hoskote town and then becomes drinking water for Hoskote town. Nobody tells them about reverse osmosis or anything, it's just wet night of Oscota which is cleaning it up, goes into the aquifer, they check for BI is 10500, Oscota 80,000 uh, uh, denizens of Oscota town are drinking, uh, drinking the sewage which flows into Yalmalapa Chetty. That's the water quality. Now, why don't we throw some science and knowledge into this? Why don't we understand this process better? Why don't we manage it so that it always continues to fulfill the purpose for which it is designed? That's a big question. Same happens in Nalbag Lake. This is a well from Hyder Ali's time. So you can revive a well from Hyder Ali's time using the uh, extended aerator system designed by Dr. Anand Korvasal and marry the future and the present, in the, uh, future and the past in the present and get benefits out of it. So all these are possibilities for Bangalore, which I think we should uh, explore more. Or we can start to stay asleep like the community described here 
uh, it's for us the choice is ours so i just wanted to share this bigger picture with you and sort of also compliment you on the kind of works that you're taking up thanks a lot thank you <laughs> Mapping plan, like maybe you yeah, just one other thing for uh, with the help of Wipro, we've taken up a 40 square kilometer area around Sarjapur Road, uh, and uh, we are trying to develop a community based groundwater uh, monitoring system, understanding system, uh, which includes about 15 lakes and all the borewells there. So, we would uh, welcome volunteers who are in that area, particular area. We will uh, circulate that information. If you could share with us the data that you have on the borders that you have and the wastewater treatment plants that you have set up, we would like to raise it at a community level for 40 square kilometers. We would like to put that with you in a participatory fashion. That's your right. That's our idea. But we will give you the details through the website or through email. Thanks. Can you send this detail with your email ID that was mentioned here? Which details? Sir? We will share. Uh, uh, all the stuff we'll be, I think, sending out to the participants. Yeah, we'll send you an email on this, but you wanted this presentation? What did you say? What did you want oh, to share? Right. right. No, we'll send you a separate uh, one with a small questionnaire. It's a six question uh, kind of a format. If you're sharing it, it'll be great. Yeah, thanks. Two questions. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. What are the practices in uh, other countries on rainwater? Uh, other countries? Yeah, outside India. Yeah, there are about 100 countries which are part of, uh, which do rainwater harvesting, and they do it based on their own lo uh, location-specific uh, uh, requirement. Yeah, how effective you know, is it I mean, compared to other countries? The amount of rain that we harvest on the ground, yeah. and compared to other countries, how, how are the yeah. places? So we are unique in terms of our groundwater exploitation. In India alone, rainwater harvesting is also seen as artificial recharge. In most countries, rainwater harvesting means storage of water and reuse. Only not country it means recharge. So we do it a bit differently. And uh, the charge has been led by Amma in the south, so. <laughs> <laughs> One question. Uh, uh, what our Pigeon droppings are there in the right. terrace. Right. See, in fact, this whitewater harvesting I've been thinking of doing since last. Uh, Don't think, sir, do. Two, 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 three years. But my only worry is the likely diseases if the biological medium goes into my main sample. Absolutely. So what you do is for the drinking water, you put this water. Whatever filter he showed, is it effective or? There are two ways of filtering it. If you want to drink the water, which is your point of concern with the pigeon droppings, put it through a filter like a Tata swatch or a Purit, then you can drink it. There's no problem at all. The rest of the water for cooking is boiled anyway. The pigeon droppings are generally sterilized on the rooftop, so there's nothing to worry about. But take an extra precaution, uh, the added calcium and magnesium, you take care of it through the Tata Swatch or Purit filter. Most of the people are buying the water outside, I'm having RO in my house. That's not a problem for me. Yeah. 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 But there are, as you said, there are many small kids. Every day there is a birth taking place, there are small kids. If somebody falls sick, they should not blame us because you have done this, that is why our no. child is falling sick. That's what, what I'm su suggesting is that there's a post filtration of rainwater also, which is suggested when the water is to be drunk. There's a pre filtration of the rainwater before storage. Is it effective? No, the pre filtration is necessary. It is not to remove the bacteria and virus. It cannot remove bacteria and virus. Any pre filter cannot remove that. So if you want to drink it and drink it safely, you must pass it through a RO system. A UV system or a basic gravity filter. But simple for washing of vessels and taking bath, uh, no problem. There's no issue at all. It's only the water that goes into the system that needs to be of the highest quality. So I have a question here. In our apartment, we are going to extract STV water. We try to connect, try to pass it on to Munakolel Lake. You are going to access the stream water, we want to pass it on to Munakolel Lake. So we try to seek the permission from BBMP who has renovated the lake. They are absolutely against it. What they say, by any chance, the algae formation happened, you will be responsible for it. So what's the best way to save the water from throwing out rather going to the lake? No, so that's an extended uh, dialogue with the Pollution Control Board. You'll have to get permission from the Pollution Control Board. You'll have to get permission from the BBMP. There will have to be an intermediate constructed wetland to be able to handle the nitrates and phosphates, which may be in excess of the, mm. uh, in the STP water, which causes the algae formation. The constructed wetland has to absorb the phosphates and nitrates, and only then the water has to reach the tank. Oh. Yes. Now, I didn't do it. This is happening by serendipity. The BWSSB did it. The BDA did it. The PCB did it. Nobody knows. And because it happened by serendipity, nobody objected. <laughs> Otherwise, they would have objected. So, it all happened by chance. So, we have about uh, three apartment 
that's kind of what the three hundred apartments are there. So, so there, we need a huge wet, wetland for that. Then. No, so there has to be a design for a wetland. Depending on the uh, input quality water and the size of the lake, that needs to be designed. So, who can be approached for the design of the wetland? Uh, Dr. T. V. Ramchandra from Indian Institute of Science is there. Uh, A3 is there as an organization. These two are organizations which can help you with okay, that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. In general, I mean, do you have any uh, standard way you would recommend recharging the treated water? Because one of the things, every apartment has excess treated water. Treated and water. Everybody is, you know, leading yeah. it out to the storm water. What's the you know, best way to So have that's why the treated wastewater, in terms of the law, cannot be recharged. You cannot recharge it. It's just not allowed. So the best way for excess treated wastewater is for the city to intermediate, to take it to the lake or to the wetland. And, uh, and then allow the recharge through the wetland uh, lake process. That's why the um, apartments and layouts have to engage with the broader uh, issue of the lake or the wetland near to them and make sure that the treated waste water goes there. But that requires a dialogue with the pollution control board. Yeah, but right now there is a zero discharge policy. Correct. And there is no way to actually you know implement in practice. That's why everybody is kind of, it's almost like everybody is breaking the law in a way because it's just has to be let out. It has to go somewhere. The world is full of these kind of uh, idiosyncrasies and problems. Now, if we only look at our own apartment and want to manage it, perhaps we may not be able to solve all the problems. Therefore, I'm calling on all the enlightened citizens here who are part of the residents and apartments to get into the dialogue with the PCB and the BBMP to enable it to happen, along with the experts. Now, together, we have to make that happen. Otherwise, it cannot Which work. is one of the questions I actually asked Mr. Venkara. If there is a, I mean, from a state, can they support collecting or, you know, channelizing the treated water in a way that they can process it better? But they really are not looking at getting into the space. For them, even the individual STPs don't exist in their planning design system. They're putting up 25, ML, uh, 25 STPs for 1,040 MLD of uh, wastewater being generated. And all the individual STPs which have been set up in apartments do not figure in their planning manual at all. But Dr. Anand is a better person to explain that. We so, had a lot of discussions with the chairman of the Pollution Control Board regarding this excess water discharge. <coughs> the reason he gives is that they do not have enough uh, people to monitor whether people are discharging treated water meeting uh, the quality standards or not. That is one uh, argument. And the uh, Pollution Control Board by itself appears to be favoring uh, people to discharge into the storm drain which leads into the lake. But I believe the urban uh, development department is against it. <coughs> that is one reason they put. But I heard recently that uh, LCA, which has become LCTA, has been allowed to discharge. If they put up a treatment plant, they will be allowed to discharge into the lake. So right now there is no other practical solution or a end use. The problem is the nitrate and sulfate basically, isn't it? Phosphates. 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 I think uh, one of the TV shows was showing like uh, take all this treated water to some farm land. Uh, surrounded uh, uh, cities, some villages. They can use it for farming the uh, vegetables and other things. That's the logistic, the operational issue. How do you get this water there? No, no, and then tank we, we are building dams and taking the water. So this also. <coughs> no. In this space, yeah. we should yeah. of the wet, to the wetlands because wetlands wouldn't be feasible in small apartments, right? We have vertical wetlands, vertical constructed wetlands with vertical biofilters, which could, which could help. Yes, yes. So, but these are technical issues. See, right now the design of STPs is to deal with what the PCB allows as the design discharge norms. Now, if the design discharge norms are to be exceeded, there's no ban on that. So, we've got to figure a way out of removing nitrates and phosphates. You actually have something in your terrace, right? That drum thing which yeah, yeah. removes. I mean, so, I would that suggest something that is actually a scalable apartment level solution. I mean, I grow rice on the rooftop, so rice loves the phosphates and nitrates and grows very well. So you can grow paddy instead of lawn. lawn. Seriously, don't grow lawn. Lawn is a grass, paddy is a grass. You will get to eat the rice that comes out of it. And paddy is a great uh, absorber of phosphates and nitrates. It thrives on it. one use for treated water. <laughs> okay, last question. Uh, the recharge wells, uh, is it more suited to, uh, for the uh, layouts that there, the wide areas, uh, open areas, that they, for majority of the people here present who uh, stay in the apartments with maybe not so big open areas, 
how can we uh, effectively recharge uh, to the recharge wells and uh, can are recharge wells feasible and practical for uh, apartment community well, you will not be able to harvest 100% of the rainwater that falls. So you have to make a beginning. Just take a space of 3 feet only, 20 feet. But there are huge issues because some of them have basements, double basements. Those become problems. So in my humble opinion, apartments should not be built in Bangalore. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll leave it at that. So this is a... Uh, it's a problem that cannot be solved by water or rainwater, the, uh, the vertical. Uh, thank you, Vishwanath. Uh, I request Vikram, who's probably a very, very new MC member. He apparently became uh, joined the committee only a few days ago to give a bouquet to Vishwanath. Bouquet in all the knowledge. Thanks.